Today's episode is about Lakshmi. She is the goddess of wealth and luck who temporarily becomes human, complete with an adoptive human family. All because she plucked a flower despite Vishnu's words of caution. Welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast that will take you on a journey through the rich mythology, folklore and history of the Indian subcontinent. I am Narad Muni, the celestial storyteller and the original Time Lord. With my ability to travel through space and time, I can bring you fascinating stories of the past, the present and the future from the epic tales of the mahabharat and ramayan to the folk tales of the panchatantra to stories of akbar birbal and tenali raman i have a story for every occasion the purpose of the stories is neither to pass judgment nor to indoctrinate my goal is only to share these stories with people who may not have heard them before and to make them more entertaining for those who have one of you listeners requested a story about lakshmi so here we are and thank you advika for the suggestion let's jump right in and begin in the ocean of milk this is where vishnu and lakshmi hang out often if you don't know who vishnu is he is the preserver of the universe together with brahma who created the universe and shiva who can destroy it the three of them are the holy trinity in indian mythology lakshmi is the goddess of wealth fortune power fertility beauty and maya or illusion she is also vishnu's wife not surprising since vishnu is quite the expert at maya himself if you recall episode 0 rockstar he gave me quite a jarring lesson on maya anyway this power couple but in the friendly coils of sheshnag the ultimate snake as he floated in the ocean of milk but it wasn't just the two of them i was there too you see i am a bona fide mythological character myself my father is brahma the creator and i am vishnu's number 1 fan and president for life of his fan club naturally i'm always on the lookout for any opportunity that i can get to visit vishnu so on this day i was going on and on about my latest visit down to earth when vishnu cleared his throat to say that it was about time for him to go to work business trip it was time for him to visit earth lakshmi asked him if she could go along now that might sound weird what with me being right there and all but don't worry about me i'm not your usual guest I'm sort of part of the family, don't you know? Vishnu politely refused Lakshmi's request, just as he had done the last few times. Earth was a boring place, quite monotonous, he said. 
I raised my eyebrows at that. I wondered out loud that earth was surely not as monotonous as being in the middle of an ocean of milk. Honestly, you couldn't even tell the directions here. Turn any which way, the landscape looked exactly the same. The only excitement here recently was when Seishnag had once flicked his tail and a tiny little ripple spread out over the ocean of milk. That was exciting because this ocean hadn't seen any waves, not since the Devs and the Asurs had churned it long ago. Coincidentally, Lakshmi had been born then. She had emerged from this very ocean. And we have covered that story before in episodes 51, 52 and 53. Well, all right, you can come along, Vishnu reluctantly agreed. But he added that he had two conditions. One was that Lakshmi could not go north. And two, she could not take anything. Absolutely no souvenirs. He said that as preserver of the universe, he had to enforce a strict policy not to intervene. Maybe I was feeling a little mischievous. And that made me bold enough to ask a second question. Seriously? No intervention? The losers of the Mahabharat war and all of Lanka in the time of the Ramayan war might beg to differ. That was different, Narad, and you know it, Vishnu said. I took an oath to wipe out injustice and I was really preserving justice and peace. He was right, of course. I know. I can see alternate timelines and I don't think that you humans would have been at all happy if Ravan had won in the Ramayan or if the Pandavas had lost the Mahabharat war. To take just two examples. I let it go and I changed the topic by pointing out that in order to meet Vishnu's conditions, Lakshmi just needed a compass and a compass. I meant a physical compass and a moral compass. No one laughed. Besides, Lakshmi wasn't interested in technicalities about interference and such. She was just eager to go see Earth. So, she readily agreed with Vishnu's terms and conditions. And she agreed with the cookie policy, which was that she had to accept any cookies any Earth person might offer her. Not so different from the 21st century, I guess. The two of them went to Earth. I could not go along as much as I wanted to. I had a party to go to in Swarg. That's where most of the Devs were. Indra, the chief of the Devs, hosts these fabulous parties and normally I'd skip them to go along with Vishnu and Lakshmi. But this time, Indra had specifically asked me to perform at that party. And me? I'm always willing to belt out songs whenever I have an audience. So, I could not say no. Meanwhile, Lakshmi went down to earth with Vishnu. Vishnu said that he had a few things to take care of. 
some devotees to bless, some evil guys to stop, some people to meet, and so on. Of course, Lakshmi would be free to explore on her own. She just had to get back to the rendezvous in an hour. Lakshmi agreed. An hour would be plenty of time. If you're wondering whether they synchronized their watches, sure, let's say they did. Except, given that they were supernatural beings, they didn't really need to. With Vishnu gone, Lakshmi looked around at all the beautiful fields rolling off in every direction. There were fruit trees, fragrant flowers, babbling brooks. The weather was perfect. The grass smelled sweet. This was wonderful. She wandered on until she came to a farm. This farm was a little bit unusual compared to everything else that she had seen. It was run down. The farmer must be down on their luck, she thought. Or maybe they had been put out to pasture. Pun not intended, maybe. There was hardly anything growing in the farm, except for one small tree at the very edge of the farm, and it had one single flower growing on it. Lakshmi stood there, next to the tree, wondering what misfortune had fallen on this farm. And then something strange happened. The flower fell from the tree, but not to the floor. A gentle breeze softly deposited that flower straight into Lakshmi's hair. Lakshmi thought that the flower looked good, so she kept it. But now, it was time to go back. She went back to the rendezvous with mixed feelings. She had loved the sights and sounds of earth, but she was eager to go back home with Vishnu. Vishnu was also eager to go back home with Lakshmi. But he took one look at her and realized that they couldn't do that. The flower in her hair had not belonged to her. It didn't matter that it was going to fall to the ground. By keeping it, Lakshmi had violated one of the conditions. And even if there seemed any sort of ambiguity in this, there was absolutely no ambiguity about the other condition. Because that rundown farm that Lakshmi had visited had been in the north. There was only one way out of this. Lakshmi would have to live on earth as a human for three years. And what's more, she would have to live with the family that she had wronged. That might be enough to pay back the debt of the flower. You might think that to a goddess, three years is nothing. And you'd be right. Except you're forgetting that Lakshmi had now suddenly become human. She did retain her memory. She probably retained her powers too. But she was just unable to use them. Vishnu went back to his home. The three years would pass quickly for him. He remained a god after all. Lakshmi, meanwhile, had transformed her appearance 
into that of a poor, hungry and tired woman. She couldn't very well walk in with rich clothes and jewels into a family that was way below the poverty line. When she reached the farm, she knocked on the door. The door was answered a little reluctantly. But when the farmer saw who was at his doorstep, he seemed relieved. Come in, dear lady. He invited her in. For a moment, I thought the bill collector had come knocking. The family was just sitting down to dinner. And dinner was radish salad. Technically, it was a salad made from a single radish. That seemed to be all that was available to feed their family of five. The farmer, whose name was Madhav, introduced himself and his wife, Madhavi. Madhavi was a tired old lady, but she did not forget her manners. She insisted that Lakshmi sit down to dinner with them. And what's more, she gave up her own share of the radish salad so that Lakshmi could eat. Lakshmi explained that she was in a bit of a situation at the moment. It was her own fault for having ignored the fine print. And that meant that for a few years, she'd be homeless. The chickens have come home to roost. The eldest daughter, Buddy, said as she came in to the room and seated herself at the table. She looked at the confused stairs and explained that what she said was meant to be taken literally. It wasn't a metaphor or anything. Really, the chickens on the farm had scattered in every direction this morning. Now, Buddy had just returned from the coop, where they had all come back to roost for the night. It was a bit surprising that the chickens had all come back. You'd expect them all to wander away to freedom. But he added that she wasn't one to look a gift horse in the mouth. That seemed to remind the middle daughter, Madhya, of something. Madhya spoke and asked if they shouldn't sell their last remaining horse or even give it away as a gift. He was a bit of a white elephant. And that last... She meant metaphorically, not literally. The family were spending a lot of their hard-earned savings in taking care of the horse. And that horse wasn't really helping them bring home the bacon. That's the fifth time you're bringing it up, Madhavi said. I think we have to stop beating on that dead horse. We are not getting rid of him. He's family. Madhavi might have used that expression very innocently, but everyone let out a little involuntary shudder at her choice of phrase. The youngest daughter, Choti, wanted to change the subject. She was worried that it had been three days since they had lost their only cow. That cow was their only hope of a better life. She was convinced of it. We are worrying too much about all these things, Madhavi said, with a sudden dash of optimism. 
and confident will get through these. More importantly, I think we need to make a family decision here. I vote to have Lakshmi live with us as our new adoptive daughter. Maybe there was some lingering influence from Lakshmi's superpowers as the goddess of fortune, but something about her presence seemed to fill the family with a renewed sense of hope. Things would be all right after all. And the salad of a single radish hadn't been enough to fill their stomachs, but they still slept peacefully that night. And after that, it was just one bit of luck after another. The next day, over dinner, Madhav explained how he had no trouble at all with the missing cow. Dinner was lavish that night because apparently a passing food truck had somehow prepared double of her very rich customer's orders. And the food truck had a lot of food remaining and they'd rather give it away for free than to let it go to waste. Everyone walked away happy. So, in between large swigs of mango lassi and gulps of golgappe, Madhav explained that finding the cow had been pretty easy. He had tracked her down. No one laughed at his dad joke. But he recovered quickly and went on to credit Lakshmi for having suggested a direction to search in. Everyone was pleased with how helpful Lakshmi had been. The recovery of the cow alone made everyone happy. But Madhavi worried that all their eggs were in one basket if they were depending too much on this one cow to change their fortunes. But Ma, that's where you're utterly wrong. We are not entirely dependent on the cow. Buddy said. She was happy to report that the chickens seemed to have laid twice the number of eggs they normally did. And though Buddy was a habitual pessimist, even she thought it was perfectly all right to count their chickens before those eggs hatched. She didn't know what she had done differently for the chickens to lay so many eggs. Maybe the only thing that was different was that Lakshmi had come along to the chicken coop and helped to clean it. Madhya, the middle daughter, had good news too. Their horse had ploughed all the field entirely by himself. And he had done a pretty solid job of it too. Well, not entirely by himself. It was Lakshmi who had attached the plough to the horse. Choti shared her bit of good news. Their farm was going to win an award. Yeah, right, Buddy said skeptically. When pigs fly... No, 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 Choti corrected. The Flying Pigs Award is in a separate category. The one we won is for Best Dressed Scarecrow. Ours was outstanding in his field. Come to think of it, it was Lakshmi who chose his clothes today, Choti added. 
The award may not be much, Madhav said, but it may improve our brand recognition. And it did. After that, things only got better. Good things seemed to happen around Lakshmi, and the family recognized that. I guess they thought that she was a little bit like Gladstone Gander from DuckTales. She brought incredible luck to everyone around her. If there had been the concept of a lottery in ancient India, the family might have tried convincing Lakshmi to buy a ticket. Let's fast forward three years. Madhav had bought the farm. And not just one farm, but many other farms around his own. He was now a landlord. And he had a sprawling estate. He owned everything for miles around him. But he remained the same friendly, hospitable farmer as before. So, it was even okay for the children in the neighborhood to create crop circles in his fields with a protractor. Madhavi was a rich landlady, but she hadn't forgotten her roots and she remained hospitable as ever. And following on from their parents, their girls had stayed humble as well. They knew that Lakshmi was a big part of their success. She seemed to have a hand in every bit of success they had, whether it was a trade negotiation, or when they found a pot of buried gold, or when they discovered oil in their fields and promptly set up oil wells that were practically minting gold. One day, on the three-year anniversary of when Lakshmi had first appeared, Choti was out on a walk, and that's when she saw her adoptive sister. The tree that three years ago had borne a single flower now, it was in full bloom. Lakshmi stood there. But it wasn't regular old Lakshmi. She looked divine. Maybe it was the halo around her that gave that impression. Or maybe it was the extra pair of arms that she now had. Or maybe... It was the accompanying elephants that were standing next to her, on bent knees, with garlands in their trunks. Choti rushed home and fetched her family to the scene. As Choti demonstrated, you can't really keep a secret on a farm. After all, potatoes have eyes and the corn have ears. The family returned. There was some nervousness. They didn't know what the protocol was. Had they violated some kind of a sacred rule by making a goddess work on their farm? Lakshmi reassured them. They had not. They had treated her like a goddess by opening their hearts and their home to her. And that is what had changed their luck. It wasn't just Lakshmi's presence. And now, she must depart. But the family's luck would stay. Until the cows came home, or until they stopped being their kind humble selves, whichever was earlier. They should read the full terms and conditions. That's the end of the story. A few notes. 
In keeping with the tradition of the show, the daughters are named for the roles they play. Buddy is big or elder. Choti is small or younger. And Madhya is the middle one. Check out the links in the show notes about previous Lakshmi episodes. Including one where I got to be the judge in a beauty contest between Lakshmi and Shani. Though Lakshmi was created in the churning of the ocean, there is a conflicting account that says that she was a daughter of Bruhu. Bruhu was one of the Sapta Rishis or seven Hall of Fame Rishis. But there is yet another Lakshmi story that resolves that conflict. And we have covered that story before in episode 100, which was about Tirupati. Another variation of the story has it that Lakshmi was born as Bruhu and his wife Khayati's daughter. The theme of a virtuous person going through a few years of hardship is something that comes up frequently. The Pandavas did it in the Mahabharat. Ram, Lakshman and Sita had to do it in the Ramayana as well. Harishchandra had to do it too. And that is one king whose story I'm yet to cover on the show. So, we'll be doing that one soon as well. That's it for now. In the next episode, we'll continue the Mahabharat. We had left off with the Pandavas escaping an assassination attempt. Now, we'll find that they may only have swapped the frying pan for the fire. And this metaphorical fire was a demon who was just really, really hungry. Thanks to everyone for the wishes. It feels amazing for this podcast to be named the number one Indian mythology podcast according to Feedspot. And this was only possible because of your support. So a big thank you to all of you for all your love, support and feedback. Check out the link in the show notes and on the site sfipodcast.com to see Feedspot's rankings. Thank you for all the comments on social media and on Spotify's Q&A. I can't directly reply to the questions there, but I'll address them here on this show. Thank you again for all the messages of concern. I feel like I'm back to 100% now. Thank you Raju, Rez, Darsh, HYSR, Navya, Vishrut and Nilambri. Paras, I will get to the story of how Karna meets his end in the Mahabharat. But I have to consider how best to do it without giving away too much. Manju, I will get to the story of Parikshit as well. If you have any other comments or suggestions or if there are any particular stories that you would like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at sfipodcast or reply to the questions on Spotify's Q&A. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.